Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Uh, hi, I'm Bob. I'm an alcoholic and, uh, and an addict and uh, codependent and uh, adult child and just basically my days are full <laughs> which gives me you know an advantage over the average guy who just kind of gets up and goes to work and he doesn't get to have all these people talking to him all the time that that I do I went home one night you know it's amazing how you I hear things I never it eh, never mind anyway I um <laughs> I uh, uh, went home one night. I was very stressed out. I don't know what it was over something. It was probably a relationship. It was back in that period where I, I thought that, that if I could just find her, everything would be all right. I'd be cruising the streets at 4 o'clock in the morning looking for her. I knew exactly what she looked like. She was 5'11", blonde, very beautiful. She'd be standing there in the street by her Rolls Royce. And as I came cruising by, she'd say, you're the one I've been waiting for. And I'd say, yeah, <laughs> you know, and then we'd go home and that would be it. It would be fine. And not, not, nothing's dying on me. That who the hell wants some, some babes that's out at four in the morning on the streets, you know. But <clears throat> besides that, <laughs> what I eventually discovered was when I was in that place, I was looking for God, but I needed some sort of physical form, some some earthly form that I could see, touch, hold, and then I would be okay. And that that would be my God would then fill me with whatever I needed that day or that night or whenever. So whenever I'm out there cruising, well, I don't do much of that anymore, actually. <laughs> I've grown up, which is boring. It's uh, <laughs> I still I still have fun. He asked if everybody could hear him, and somebody in the front row said, "Yeah." <laughs> <laughs> oh God, I love it. You know, the alcoholic. It's always about us, right? <laughs> I, I, it's, oh God, never mind. <clears throat> Let's get serious. I've been sober like 40, 40 years, 41 years, something like that. We got here when I was 12. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I do deserve the credit too. <clears throat> True humility, you know what I mean? You you make it this far, baby, you've been through some shit, let me tell you. Everything will be okay, but it doesn't mean that you'll never hurt again. So that's what I heard when they said everything will be okay. What I heard was you'll never hurt again. And then when I started to hurt and things began to, I, feelings began to come up, I didn't know what feelings were. I grew up in a neighborhood where we laughed when the dog got hit by a car. You know, you had to be a tough guy. If you weren't a tough guy, man, you were dead, you know. And uh, um, it's like, it's so, I think about how hard it was for me to get in touch with feelings and and to express feelings. Now, I may talk about feelings, and talking about feelings might make you uncomfortable. If it does, you could leave now, actually. Uh, that's honorable. If you leave now, that's honorable. You know, there's something you don't like, and you're not going to sit around and listen to it. So you just get up and, and go, you know. But don't just stay and sit and judge me. There's nothing honorable in that, you know, so... The feelings are going to disturb you. They disturb me all the time. 
They even wake me up. They always want to talk. <laughs> At three. Three in the morning, and they have a tendency to be negative. <laughs> they sort of know what the next five years is going to be like, and none of it's good, you know. <laughs> so the, <clears throat> the wants to talk to me about that, you know, how bad it's going to be. And, uh, oh, God. I once I went home and had a meeting by myself. <laughs> I woke up about three in that panic, <clears throat> you know, and, and the rest of my life was going to just be terrible, you know, just this bag of manure. And, uh, and I just didn't, you know, I couldn't call anybody. I don't, I don't call and ask for help. Are you kidding? That's not, uh, <laughs> Not, not where I come from, not how I grew up. You don't ask for help. You don't let anybody know you need it. You just don't ask for help. So I couldn't call a sponsor at three. Giving me your phone number was a waste of time because I always hurt like three o'clock in the morning. Seems to be the magic hour for a lot of us. Three o'clock, up, <laughs> wide awake. Chances of going back to, to sleep are slim and none. You know, it's like, uh, and I, and I always tried in the beginning until I finally gave up. Somebody taught me not, not, not to bother. Just get up. It's three o'clock, doesn't matter. Get up. You're not sleepy. Don't lay, don't, don't lay there and try and put yourself back to sleep. You know, I'd lay there all real tight in the ball and, you know, and pray. And somebody'd say, well, pray until you, until you reach the end. Say the Lord's Prayer over and over. Until you uh, get to the end and you remember the word that has gone before, you know. And so I would say the Lord's Prayer probably would take about an hour to, to get to, go to accomplish that, and uh, and uh, uh, I couldn't get back to sleep. And so the getting up is a good idea. You guys, can I share that with anyone? You want to just get up? Then if you uh, happen to have more than one voice in your head, and they are. I have a tendency to be combative at times. You might want to do what I do, which is then put all your chairs in the house in a circle. <laughs> Get out the big book and have a discussion meeting. I mean, you got to have a discussion meeting because something's troubling you, which means that you're in conflict. You know, something's wrong. So then you can, you know, as the leader, you pick someone to read the 12 steps. And you get up and move to that chair and sit in it. Eventually, I'll tell you, this one will tire you out and get you back to sleep. I also guarantee you'll wind up screaming at yourself. And it's the point that when you're screaming at yourself that you get it's pretty funny, you know. It isn't really quite as serious as perhaps you were making it out to be, you know. I can get that nuts over like an envelope from the IRS. I can't open it. Can you? You open that shit? I can't open it. I get nuts. I get nuts because I know what's in it. So you got like, like when, uh, was it Johnny Carson would, you know, read the envelope through his forehead. Yeah, you know, it's, it's like, I could do that with my mail, you know? Just stick it up there and know it's a bill and, <laughs> throw it away be responsible you know be, be the best example of AA I can be <laughs> I uh, I have this you may wonder how I got this you may not wonder how I got it I haven't talked in a long time it's been quite a while a couple of years for the most part, I think I talked once or twice. This was supposed to be a small meeting, like, you know, 10, 12 people. <laughs> Thank you for coming out for my coming out. <laughs> I mean that. Thank you. It's um, It's been hard. I like speaking. I love speaking. Yeah, I, I wouldn't have told you that prior to AA or my my first year. I would not have, you know. You said you're going to be a speaker. You know, I said, well, let's see, you. see ya. <laughs> Get up before all those people and talk. 
And then I found out all you had to do is get up here. In the beginning, when you first started out as a speaker, all you got to do is get up here and lie. You know, you cre- I created a great story about my past. None of it was true, but it was funny. It, it was funny and sad. It had all the right ingredients in it. Made people feel stuff. So, uh, <laughs> someone just distracted me. It makes me smile, making me think about the heart and God. And any, anyway, um, um, I'm here. You know, it's like, this is from a car wreck. January 3rd. 2001. Uh, I had just had, I'd had my daughter with me who was 13 then for about three weeks over Christmas and New Year's. And had a ball. We just had the best time. I tell you, it was one of those visitations that everything went right from the moment she arrived. And I was just on seventh heaven. Couldn't have been happier. And I had just dropped her off. I lived in Tarzana. You know, me, me and Jane. Um, oh, you can deteriorate quick, can you? <laughs> Straight in the toilet, from heaven to the toilet. I had just dropped her off in Palm Springs and um, was headed back home. And this young girl, women, right? We, it's, our problems are always with women. <laughs> what? Ah, oh, what? <laughs> nothing wrong with that. You know, it's fun. You know, living with somebody who wants to kill you, you know. <laughs> Keeps your uh, keeps your adrenaline up, you know. And we are many of us are adrenaline junkies. A lot of us that's our drug in sobriety in recovery. Anxiety is our drug of choice. Yeah. And it's a good choice because you don't need anybody. You can you can be home alone in a chair and create it all by yourself. <laughs> It's kind of like, you know, being Star Trek, man. So just go sit in the chair and, and away I'd go. I'd leave. <laughs> Goodbye. See ya. We're going to mull this little problem over. Well, that's when you get the chairs out and put them in a circle. You know. <laughs> it works. Don't, don't, you know, it works. Uh, anyhow, this young woman had a flat tire. In the fast lane. I was in the fast lane, and I was doing about 55. I was so mellow from this visit with my daughter. I love her so much. And we had just had a love fest the the time she was with me. I was just cruising along, you know, in fast lane, about 55, smoking a cigar, drinking a little Diet Coke. Mellowed out, completely mellow. Just guides were passing me on the right, you know, and giving me that look, you know. I thought, you ought to know that I used to jump in the middle of people's hoods and intersections, you know, when I was first sober, so don't fuck with me. (laughs) Those are bad days. Anyway, get sidetracked. Anyway, she had a flat tire, so she's in the fast lane, so she she turns off her engine. And and parks, basically, in the fast lane. I come around the curve on 10, out by Colton, San Bernardino, somewhere in that area, because that's where they took me to the hospital. And uh, there's a parked car in front of me, and I'm doing 55. There is uh, what followed was a... Interesting, I was in and out of consciousness for a little while because I had removed the windshield with my head. All my ribs were broken. The sixth and seventh cervical vertebrae were fractured at the tips. Um, 
I went that I went into a coma for a month almost. Um, well, the ambulance ride was interesting because I was still going in and out, you know. And I always would come to at the wrong time. I came to when they were cutting my side to put the tube in to refill the lung, you know, that had collapsed. And that's the moment I come to, you know, he sticks and I'm, and I'm awake. It's like timing has always been my, you know, <laughs> it's always been great. <laughs> So anyway, we're riding to the hospital, and they're in the front. You know, one's in the front, one's sitting with me in the back, and I come to, come to, and they they got three three different hospitals. They're they're trying to figure out which one they're going to take me to, and finally the guy driving says, "Well, we'll take them to Arrowhead Hospital," which which by the way isn't isn't as bad as it sounds. <laughs> but let me tell you, when you're laying in the back, man, it doesn't sound good. You know, I'm 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 laying back there. I'm trying to talk. But I can't because my throat's all crushed, and, and uh, I can just get out. Oh, spurs. And I want to get out the guy if I can. And I'm back there screaming, and you can't hear me because it's just a little whisper. But I'm saying, "Fuck Arrowhead, man! I want to." <laughs> I want to hear Cedars. I want to hear UCLA. I don't want to hear Arrowhead. You know, I'm hurt here, man. <laughs> this isn't some bullshit busted fingernail. You know, I'm, I'm. Uh... Then I pass out again. You know, and then come to when they're sticking the knife in me to put the tube in. Like oh, this is God. Then I was gone for weeks, and finally they. Brought my uh, ex-wife in and my daughter and everybody to say goodbye. Uh, they were gonna, they were getting ready to put me in pieces and send me off to be p- transplanted in different people because my brain waves took a dump and uh, there was too much fluid and so that's a lot of things. And my ex-wife, God bless her, she, uh, she's very formidable. When she wants to be, she can make you head for the hills. Let me tell you. And uh, she is uh, she she convinces them that although we're divorced and she's remarried, that she still has power of attorney over my health decisions. <laughs> be, because we have the, the, the daughter, and we felt we both feel it should be the other parent making the health decisions. Um, because the child is involved, you know, and and uh, then and then um, she looked at the thing and she said, besides, just that uh, that drop in the way brain waves could only it could just mean he's doing some thinking. <laughs> she tells his neurosurgeon, you know, that he gets the. It gets pretty intense when he thinks, you know. So she wouldn't let him carve me up, and they didn't. And uh, I guess later, a couple of days, I came to. Now, here I am, 38, nine years sober, laying there. I've come out of a coma. The coma's fascinating. Coma's cool. I'm, I'll tell you that, you know, because you miss all that shit. When they're putting the bar in between your legs and putting the boots on and neck braces and, you know, when drilling holes in you and stuff, it's like you miss it all. You're all. You don't, you get none of it. You know, you're busy chasing some, uh, uh, your first ex-wife down the highway with the car in the, in the coma, you know. <laughs> and the th- best thing about coma, in a dream you wake up, you know, when it gets to, when you get to be too, too bad of a person, or at least I do. So, so, but in a coma, you get to run them down. You know, you get to go. Uh, the, the coma doesn't care. You know. It's just, <laughs> <clears throat> well, you would think that I would say something spiritual. 
coming out of coming out of a coma like that and 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 uh looking at how busted up I was and that I was alive and that my first words would be you know some praise God glory hallelujah you know something like that but unfortunately or fortunately I'm an old television writer I wrote television for about 25 years and my opening line was that's a shit show would you change the channel <laughs> my mind always there to be supportive and helpful <laughs> always positive moving me forward down the spiritual highway Well, about four months later, I'm sitting in the, I'm in my third hospital, and I'm sitting in the wheelchair out in the patio. We just finished some physical therapy. We've gone through stuff. Well, my hip had been fractured and the, and the socket had fractured and everything was pieces in there and they had just put it back together, you know, where, where it came apart and you just put a screw in or, you know, or hung the clip on or, you know, hit it with a staple gun, or you know, it did look like a row of staples in, you know, in inside when I saw the X-ray. Scared me. It hurt much worse. I used a lot more painkiller after I saw what it looked like than I did before. <laughs> Can somebody turn this morphine up, <laughs> please? I think 15 cc's in an hour is good. <laughs> Well, that's what I used to do on the streets. Mm. Um, <laughs> forgot where I was. I'll do that a bit. It's a, unfortunately, uh, for the most part, it's names and numbers that I have trouble with. Oh, I'm sitting in this patio, and um, uh, I, it comes back too. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, you ignore me. <laughs> I'm the highlight of the... <laughs> and you're going to ignore me? <laughs> I don't know who asked me, but I bet they're sorry now. <laughs> oh, God. So I'm sitting out there, sir, in the whiz wheelchair... And I'm, I've gone through a lot of stuff. Ain't gonna walk. Well, I'm gonna walk with a walker. First it was a, gonna be a wheelchair for the rest of my life. Then it was gonna be a walker for the rest of my life. And it was, then when I was moved to the third hospital, it was the first, it was the first one to ask me what, what I wanted. You know, it's amazing. I could, I could spend two or three hours on hospitals and nurses and, and, uh, I'm probably going to write a little book, I think, for caregivers, because they, they, you know, I mean, we don't pay them enough, and and they have a lot of reasons to be ang be angry, but I think caregiver is the wrong term, so, <laughs> somehow. <clears throat> anyway, I got to the third hospital, and I said, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to leave here on a cane. And they, they looked at me, this team of physical therapists, and they said, do what we tell you, when we tell you, for as long as we tell you, and we'll see that you leave on a cane. Wow. Just a simple statement. No big deal, no flags, no drums, trumpets, horns, you know, nothing. Just a simple statement. You do what we tell you to do, and you get a cane. I mean, that's a hell of a prize when you're thinking about a walker. You know, I, God, I hated being out in public on a walker. People don't see you. You know, they see you, but they just, they turn away immediately. I have a whole different attitude now about people who are ha handicapped. I try and make sure that at least I get make eye contact with them. If I don't make eye contact, I say hi. Make some contact... To, to, so that they, they, they acknowledge their existence. Cause I'll tell you, it hurts. You know, I, a friend of mine had to come get me and take me to the mall. I had to get my glasses 
my glasses were all busted up and I needed a new pair. So when I was able to go out and they could do my eyes and all that stuff, he came and got me and we went to this mall. We were out in Pomona, is where the hospital was. And uh, uh, they uh, they don't see you. And boy, it hurts. It really hurts. I just, I wanted to sit down and cry somewhere. I didn't even care if they saw me, you know. I, that's my childhood. I'm not there, you know. Being ignored or if I make a noise, I get hit. It was a pretty simple childhood, too, you know. We had real simple rules, you know. You eat your dinner. If you don't eat it, you're, it's there waiting for you at breakfast. And if you don't eat it for breakfast, it's there waiting for you at lunch. But you don't get anything to eat again until you eat that dinner, you know. I held out sometimes for as long as a week. And that's at 11 and 12 years of age. You think I have a little fuck you attitude? Uh, as, a, <laughs> as a child, I didn't quite get this parental love thing. Oh, God. Anyway. Well, I say that because, you know, when they read these things and we make a list of the people that we've harmed and we go talk to them, if you're really fortunate, you'll have a sponsor that then after that will help take you and, and get to make a list of the people that harmed you. See, I never understood one side thing. I should feel bad and they can go ahead and feel good. No, you know, they, they really hurt me. They deserve to know what what happened. And so it's another way. It's a, It's just flipping... Basically, it's like flipping the eighth and sixth, seventh, eighth, and ninth steps over, and and doing them that way. Because because it's like my sponsor said to me that the the ninth step is the step that separates the men from the boys, and if you get to there and you make it through the ninth step, you'll stay sober till you die. And they meant you know really work the steps and really do this in the you know from the book and. Uh, and you'll be okay, you know. And uh, um, forgot what point I was going to make. The book, the steps. My glasses. No, I, I, I had, I had moved on beyond that. <laughs> I may not have informed you that I had, but <laughs> which, which I guess is a little unfair, you know. But, uh, God, people that harmed me, make a list of them. Yeah, the men step separate them from boys. Uh, oh yeah, thank you. Well, somebody's listening. <laughs> Obviously, I'm not. <laughs> now I forgot, damn it. <laughs> I remember when I was, when I was, uh, before the wreck and I used to go give these workshops for psychologists and, and, uh, psychiatrists and people working in the uh, addiction, uh, addiction programs and uh i was talking to this one doctor one night and i said you know i got to get one of those overheads one of those things you slap a piece of paper on it and it shows it up on the wall behind you and he said why the hell you want one of those i said because all you guys use them you know i mean it's like pro professional you know make me look more professional then I don't have to tell them that I was thrown out of high school and they're paying me thousands of dollars to be here and talk to them. <laughs> Which gives me great internal satisfaction. <laughs> so he said, you can't have a, an overhead. I said, what? <laughs> he said, you don't understand. He said, you, you'll, you'll put a piece of paper down that will have something on it, some topic, and you'll be talking, and then you'll just turn left <laughs> and go down some other path. And while you're going down this other path, everybody's looking at the thing on the wall. <laughs> they, they want you to get back and tell them why the hell you put that up there and what it means. 
you know, and you won't remember, you know, so you can't have an overhead. <laughs> I said, oh, okay. So I used to forget sometimes before I, the wreck, but it has been a problem since the wreck. And I hate admitting that, and I hate being less than perfect at the, at the le- lectern. You know, it's like after years and years and years of just dancing around up here and, you know, bouncing and having a grand time to 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 just forget what the hell I'm saying. And, you know, it just sucks. Anyway, Um it took me uh, a year uh, after the wreck to accept the fact that I had been hurt really bad. Not just hurt, but hurt really bad. I had my therapist was trying to get me there. Friends were trying to get me there. You couldn't get me to go there. I wouldn't go there. I would not go there. I did not want to feel what it feels like to acknowledge that I've been hurt really bad. I just didn't want to feel that, you know. And if I don't acknowledge it, then it ain't there. I don't know how you live, but, you know, I have a, it's my program. <laughs> <laughs> if I fail to acknowledge it, it's gone. It suddenly becomes invisible. And I lost my train of thought again. Heart? Oh, <clears throat> so anyway, I'm sitting in the wheelchair in the patio. I'll go back and come around. <laughs> I'll sneak up on it from behind. <laughs> Well, when you go through a windshield, you got to find a new way to think. You know, it's, it's, uh, the brain builds up an excessive amount of fluid to protect itself. <clears throat> and um, what it does is make you forget where you are in your talk in AA. <laughs> oh, God, help me. Anyway, I'm sitting in the wheelchair in this patio in this hospital, the third hospital. And you would think I would have immediately begin to praise God because I'm, 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 you know, I mean, I've been there in that chair and, and I have never been enough when it comes to God. I've just never been enough. I've never been good enough, clean enough, spiritual enough. I've never been enough. I just, whatever I do, if I'm driving down the highway, and I and I make the curve there uh, on ocean and come out un, from under the bridge and and then it suddenly there's the Pacific Ocean and the sand and it's just beautiful it's just beautiful and I come around and there it is and I look at it and I smile it makes me smile it's pretty pretty things make me smile <clears throat> make me growl too but they make me smile. <laughs> I mean, I got eight eight fucking people up here trying to give a talk, and it's hard, you know. It's... <laughs> Everybody wants equal time, you know. <laughs> they, all, they all have a different point of view, which is really exhausting, you know. God, I'm still in the wheelchair, still in the patio, you know. It's terrible. Um, anyhow, um... I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, well, well, the, the oh, the ocean. So, so I'd see the ocean and I, it would make me smile and I'd drive on. And within a um, uh, hundred yards, I'm beating myself up. Now I've had a beautiful spiritual moment. I've seen God's beauty, the ocean, the clouds, the sky, the beach, and I've, it's made me smile. I've had a beautiful spiritual moment and my head is saying to me, you should have parked and sat on your fender for a while and drank it all in. See, there it is one more time. I'm not enough. That that it makes me smile. It's not enough. I got to do more. 
And because, you know, and I'm tired of being not enough. This is when I thought this. So I'm sitting in a wheelchair and I think, you know, since the wreck, I have said one prayer for maybe 15 seconds, 20 seconds. And I've meditated once, once in this four month period of time for, uh, for uh, uh, peace and spiritual connection, one time, maybe 10 seconds. So total time is 25 seconds put in here, 15 praying and 10 meditating. And that's all I've done for the four months in a hospital. You know, you, you got because you got to know what I was going through. You, you just, you know, I mean, being moved this far was, was, uh, you wanted to die, you know. So it was like it was praying and meditating you know, was not on my mind. I had to control the pain. I had to, you know, I have to, I have to do. I got to be enough. I got to do more, you know. And here I am, and I'm gonna, and I'm alive, and I'm gonna leave on a cane, and and I understood at that moment, what the word grace means. I thought of the prayer, you know, footsteps, about where there's the two sets of footsteps on the beach. God is showing this guy his life, and, he's, and then suddenly there's only one set. And the guy's saying to God, well, look at this, you know, in my worst crisis, you abandon me, you know, and leave me out there alone to, to, uh, to struggle. And God said, no, that's when I was carrying you. And I'm sitting and I'm alive. I'm alive. One small prayer, ten seconds of meditation, and I'm alive. And I was supposed to die. And I'm going to have a cane. And I'm not supposed to walk. And I, it's, I'm a miracle. And I am truly understand the grace of God. By grace, I'm going to be, you know, this. <laughs> You can you can make up your own scorecard and figure out whether or not whether or not it was worth it. <laughs> like I want a cigar right now. Um, they got me a stool I could sit on if I wanted to. If I get tired up here and because uh, they the hip started to fall apart after a year and it took them about six months to figure out it was falling apart and they replaced it not too long ago just, you know, just a lot of fun I've just had so much fun and that's being facetious it's uh, it's been a wonderful lesson but it has been uh, I don't I can live without having it again uh, you know I'm a, I'm 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 a kid from the streets, man. I don't. Uh, the problem I had with Board of Criminal Psychiatry in, in California was uh, I didn't know fear. I'd never been afraid of anything or anybody. Didn't matter how big they were; they were going to go down somehow. So you know, I got to beat this. You know. Well. Forty years of sobriety, my God. Let me tell you. So obviously, I misinterpreted the fact that you weren't going to hurt. You know that I, that 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 everything's going to be okay means you'll never hurt again. So um, I've learned something at this late stage. <laughs> See, hear that voice? You know, you're getting old and you're forgetting things and. You shouldn't have agreed to do the talk. and I mean, that's what I'm li listening to while I'm talking to you, you know. <laughs> this sick fuck is just up there going, hey, 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 you know. And all I want to do is get through the talk, you know. And it's like, maybe I could put some of these chairs in a circle up here and I could... <laughs> I could... <laughs> I could I could have a meeting. You could, you could watch me and, uh, uh, and and get how crazy I really am. You know, I'm a major fan of therapy, a major believer in the power of therapy. And uh, uh, I know some of you are uh, not major fans of therapy. 
If so, just keep your mouth shut. What about it? You you walked that golden path, the first 164 pages of the big book. That's all anyone needs. I've heard that said a lot. You'd be amazed to know I agree with you. But if you had read the big book, you probably wouldn't be saying the first 164 pages. Because on um, page 133, that's for anybody that's having more trouble with math than I am, that's under 164, comes before. But this does not mean that we disregard human health measures. God has abundantly supplied this world with fine doctors, psychologists, and practitioners of various kinds. I don't even want to guess what Bill meant by practitioners of various kinds. I mean, you got to remember him and Dr. Bob used to hit the Ouija board after meetings, you know. <laughs> Bill was a good friend of Arthur Ford's, a psychic, before, before Arthur came to the, to the fellowship and, and got sober, you know. So I have no idea what he means by practitioners of various kinds, but you can bet it would make a lot of uh, people turn white. <clears throat> Do not hesitate to take your health... This this is so unclear, I can really understand why these people don't get it. Do not hesitate to take your health problems to such persons. Most of them give freely of themselves and their fellows may enjoy sound... so that their fellows may enjoy sound minds and bodies. And I lost my place reading. Much of them give freely. Try to remember that though God has wrought miracles among us, we should never belittle a good doctor or psychiatrist. Their services are often indispensable in treating a newcomer and in following his case afterward. That's in the, in, how could they do that to you guys? <laughs> Slip in there that, that's so unclear, you know. Do not hesitate to take your health problems to such persons. Then on the next page, 134, which is still un under the 164, a word about sex relations. <laughs> uh, you know, hey, I love AA relationships, man. It's like two tr trash trucks colliding. <laughs> well, it is. <laughs> And your role in the relationship is to pick through and find out what trash is yours and what's hers. <laughs> you know. And then you'll be okay. You'll have a good relationship. You get in a lot of trouble when everybody's, you know, working on caring or apologizing for the other person's trash. <laughs> a word about sex relations. I, now, I don't know who wrote this. It wasn't me or anyone I knew well, drunk or sober. Alcohol is so sexually stimulating to some men <laughs> that they have overindulged. <laughs> I'd like to meet this guy, <laughs> you know? I mean, I know you can kind of turn around all that around with it if you, you know, shoot a fast five cc's of, of methamphetamine, but uh, other than that, they have overindulged. Couples are occasionally dismayed to find that when drinking is stopped, the man tends to be impotent. Yeah, right, that's why... Sex and Love Addicts Anonymous is filling up at the rate of a thousand a week. <laughs> Unless the reason is understood, there may be an emotional upset. <laughs> is that great? They're still probably sitting around talking about, you know, the crazy wife chasing the guy around the house with a skillet, you know. And then and, and they get it down to you know may experience an upset. <laughs> there may be an emotional upset. Yeah, there may be. 
some of us had this experience only to enjoy in a few months a finer intimacy than ever. <clears throat> there should be no hesitancy. Oh, again, they're unclear here. There should be no hesitancy in consulting a doctor or psychologist if the condition persists. We don't know, we do not know of many cases where the, di the difficult, this difficulty has lasted long. Take it to a psychologist. It's very clear about that. Get help. The hardest thing for me to do. Get help. Let somebody help me. Ask for help. Go somewhere where there's help. Just, just, just go get somebody. I did 17 years sober. Changed my life. I would have died. I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be standing up here. No way in hell. Had I not started therapy at 17 years, I was 17 years sober and all I wanted to do was die. You know? I didn't even have the energy to want to kill myself. I just wanted to lay down in a gutter with cool, clean water running through it and die. I don't know why it was my image, but, you know, that's my image. Just lay down in the gutter with clean water running over me and say goodbye. There was one point in the, in the coma where, um, I felt my whole being said, this may be it. This may be it. It may be over. And, uh, uh, what's the point of this? Oh, I th I thought about it for a minute, and I and no, I didn't get any bright light or none of that shit. But that's probably when the 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 what do you call it? You know, when the, that meter they had on my brain dropped, <laughs> and I thought it's okay. I've had a good life, man. I've had a good life, 17 years, you know, good life, made lots of money, behaved like an adolescent, spent it all, you know, I've had a lot of fun, a good time, been married a lot, you know, by then probably seven times, six, I had one more to go, I've quit, I give up. You know, it's like somebody trying to get that one class in college, and they can't get it. <laughs> Obviously, uh, somewhere in the seven relation marriages, I uh, should have got it. You know, I say that, and then uh, what? 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 Really? What? Some of you out there know is I'm just a victim of the era in which I grew up. People did not live together. Under any circumstances did a couple live together. It wasn't done. You either got married or you stopped having sexual relations. That was it. So that's why I married seven times. <laughs> now, <clears throat> when I have facing my business manager and we were sitting down figuring out my bankruptcy, don't you think I wished I'd lived with a few of them? I'm telling you, take up gambling, man. It's cheaper. No. Divorce is very expensive. Forget that. What time is it? Can I get sit down or fall over? Or whatever? What time is it? Oh, almost four. So we started at three. Okay, a couple of more minutes, I guess, here. Oh, yeah, a bear. Well, yeah, that's because I one time I had as many as 70 bears. I remember my daughter, when she was about three, we went around the house and we talked to each bear to find out which ones wanted to go live at the battered woman's shelter. So so they could be there for the mothers and the children. And uh, oh, I was heartbroken. Some of my favorite bears wanted to go, you know. 
And I, you get into this stuff with a kid, you got to go all the way. You know, you can't give it up. So I had to take about six of my favorite bears in among the other 15 or so we picked out for the kids at the, at the, at the, at the center. Yeah. I love teddy bears. Teddy bears make me smile. You know, anything that makes me smile. Like if I'm smiling, I'm in a good place, you know. It's coming, because it's coming from, I don't know how to do a fake smile. You know, I mean, I, I can't pull it off. It says you're dead. You know, I try a fake smile and it says you got three minutes left and, and, and then I'm going to kill you. So, uh, <laughs> you know, um, what a, what an incredible adventure this has been. Forty years. What an adventure. I have made major mistakes. I have spent a million bucks. Went through it like water. It's amazing how fast you can go through that. Well, you got to throw in the divorces. They got their share. I have my best friend who lives over here in Lake Tahoe now, so I, I get to be close to him. He called me one night, 3 o'clock in the morning. Of course it was 3 o'clock in the morning. He, he was awake, so I figured I should be awake. He calls me, he, 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 he says, hey, you awake? I said, well, you know, well, now I am, asshole. Uh, he says, I think we ought to take a trip around the country and visit our furniture. I thought that was a wonderful idea. <laughs> Shared it with a, with a gal who was a dear, dear friend of mine and was a dear friend when I was in the hospital. Oh, God, she was great. And uh, um, she said that that's a good idea. That what she would do is she would have an open house so the guys could come visit their furniture. <laughs> Each relationship was a different piece. Well, so you've gotten a good look at me. And, uh, you know, I may struggle a little bit mentally here and there, but I'm still sober. You got to see who I am and what it's about. And you got to hear me ramble and babble and forget where I was and all of that. And uh, <clears throat> I'm still here. I'm still sober, so I am enough. I'm enough. I mean, one day here in not too far distant future, the cane will go. Really? It's going to go, man. I am enough. The highest form of spirituality is Popeye's philosophy. I am what I am. That's really it. Accepting myself. And I'm enough. I'm enough. I got the message from some people that I wasn't enough. And it's taken a long time to undo it. But I am enough. Unfortunately, they both died before I could tell them that I was enough. So I'm extremely grateful to a God I don't understand. I'm extremely grateful to the Alcoholics Anonymous. It's, it's, it's my family, man. You guys are my family. I mean, you came out here to hear this rambling, babbling, bubbling, you know. See, there's that guy sitting up there. Hey, me, you just ramble and babble and you're not fucking enough. What do you mean, you know? You're not even close to being enough. Shut up and sit down, you know? <laughs> well, you know, I hope your days can be as full as mine. <laughs> Keeps you from being bored, and I hate being bored more than anything in the world. 
So I am enough, and God does love me, and I don't have to be doing anything. I don't have to park my car and sit on the fender for a half hour and look at the ocean. A little smile is enough. I have, I have, I have thanked God with the little smile for the beauty of the ocean and the sky and the beach. I'm enough. A smile. It's enough. It's enough. I always thought it was this big monumental thing because I was taught I was a bad person. And I was taught I wasn't enough. And I was taught I'd never get be happy. You know, all this was laid on me by a mother who was, I'm a battered child. <clears throat> We're talking broken nose and ribs and, you know, serious, uh, she, boy, she could dish it out. Uh, the message is, I'm not enough. That's what you get when you're getting beaten up, you know. But I am. Isn't that cool? Isn't that cool? I mean, you've listened to me ramble and babble and do all this, and, you know, I'm okay. I don't have to be perfect. It doesn't, my speech doesn't have to pitch talk. It doesn't have to be in line. I don't have to do it chronologically. You know? If I can even find the lectern, we're good. We're ahead. You know? I be in the moment. Okay. <laughs> I'm here, I got this far. What do you want now? You know. Whatever it is, I'm enough. So, uh, I am what I am. And I've tried to show you that. And, uh, sobriety is beautiful. AA is beautiful. It's an incredible adventure. Incredible. Enjoy the adventure. And you are who, you are the way you are right now. And you couldn't be any other way this moment based on the experiences you've had up till now. There's no way on God's earth you could be any different this moment than you are based on the experiences you've had up till this point. No way. There isn't any way you could be any different. So you are what you are. I am what I am. That's 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 what it is. So thank you for coming out for my coming out party, and uh, I I wish you as much fun as I have had. And it's all right, you know you know uh, you you can pull the blinds or not pull the blinds when you go home and have the meeting, but but that works. It's it really works. Trust me, I want to hear I want to hear from you. <laughs> I want to know what the topic was and how. What. <laughs> See, you come in here with you come in here with all these problems and and uh, and you worry about telling them to us. You know that we're going to get upset or you're going to scare us or you're going to you know disturb us. You know uh, that. But your problem, you got to understand your problems don't bother us. I mean, your problems don't bother me anyway, not a bit. What bothers me is your solutions. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Your solutions to your problems scare the hell out of me, you know? Well, I used to think of the way to end a relationship is she should die. And then you'd feel sorry for me, I'd be a widower, she'd be gone, and I could go on and, you know, look for the next person. Well, I mean, that's me. That's me, and that's what, that's, that's how it was. That's how it was. Anyway, I really love you guys. It's this, it's a good family I belong to. It's a good family you belong to. And it's okay to be a little nuts, you know. I wouldn't hesitate to have a meeting by myself. It's so much fun. You wouldn't believe how much fun it is. <laughs> you know, if you want to stop this whenever it's, it's giving you its opinions, what I say to mine is, what's your source of information? <laughs> I was thrown out of the Los Angeles City school system in the 10th grade. The system, not a school, but the entire system. I had problems by the time I was 15. Hi, hi. It's like, you know, if I, this thing so hasn't read many books, doesn't know much, 
well, it's actually read a lot of books, does know a lot. But it's, it's, uh, uh, what the fuck's the point of that? The point I'm trying to make is the point I'm trying to make is that, that is that my mind comes up with just powerful opinions about things that's willing to die to protect its opinion that it has come up with from the air. You know, it has no information. It's got nothing valid. You know, but it has an opinion on on, on nuclear physics. You know. Well, that son of a bitch is wrong. It's got something in the you know. So, <laughs> so when it's really beating you up with opinions, ask it what its source of information is. And it'll shut up. It's embarrassed when you catch it, you know. <laughs> and don't listen to it when you wake up. My mind waits for me to wake up. It sits on the headboard. When I open one eye, it says, oh, good, you're awake. I've been, I want to talk to you. And it tells me that I didn't get enough sleep. Probably going to lose my job. I haven't handled my money well. I probably have enough for six weeks. Then I won't have any place to live. I'll be in the goddamn streets broke six weeks from now. And that bump on my knee isn't isn't really from hitting the coffee table. It's bone cancer, and, <laughs> and you're gonna die. That's basically what my mind says to me in the morning, you know. And then people wonder why we aren't morning people, you know. I gotta get up. That's the first thing I get to listen to, you know. I'm dying of cancer. I'm losing my job. And I'm gonna be homeless, you know. And on that note. Thank you for sharing this moment with me. God bless you. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.